No strangers were the Americans to guided missiles, for we learned much from German experiments. The Air Forces immediately getting possession of a V-1 improved its control and accuracy. Between 1920 and 1930, the Germans had been but dreaming of guided missiles, while here in America, as far back as 1919, the Air Forces were secretly testing a pilotless flying torpedo. On September 26, 1919, the first attempt at launching the missile was made at Carlstrom Field, Arcadia, Florida, but it crashed before takeoff because of defective tracks. Another crash was caused when a fitting holding the missile to the launching car failed to hold. Further launchings were attempted, but many failures caused the torpedo to crash on takeoff. On the 24th of October, a successful takeoff was accomplished, but as soon as the altimeter took control, the missile went into a nosedive. Finally, on October 28, 1919, the altimeter system was improved and the first successful takeoff and flight was made. The flying torpedo was tracked by the DH-4 for 16 miles. 24 years later, an offspring of this flying torpedo spread death and destruction in Holland and England. As well as making many improvements on the German V-1 bomb, the Army Air Forces has had under experimentation at Wright Field during the past few years, 52 or more pilotless guided missiles. For years, aerial bombing technicians have worked on ideas for an aerial bomb which could be controlled and guided direct to the heart of a predetermined objective. Here we see such a bomb, the General Motors power-driven bomb, 1,400 pounds of potential death and destruction. At Muroc Dry Lake, the bug, as the device has been dubbed, is hoisted by a portable derrick and the launching car pulls underneath. In these tests, the bomb will be released from the launching car to simulate conditions existent if it were released from a control plane in flight. The launching car was specially built for these tests. It is powered with two 165 horsepower Cadillac engines. Each engine is connected through fluid flywheels to the drive shaft. With this special construction, it is possible to accelerate the car to a speed of 100 miles per hour in a space of 1,500 feet when fully loaded with the controllable bomb. With the bug fastened to the launching car and the release mechanism checked, the hoist is unhooked and the derrick moved away. At a prearranged spot, marked on the takeoff course, the driver of the launching car releases the small plane by means of a release lever attached to the mounting posts. In flight, the plane is directed by means of a television image which is picked up by the television camera in the bomb-like appendage beneath the fuselage of the bug. This image is flashed on a screen in the control plane. Now, before the trial flights begin, the car turns and drives partway down the track, where the bug will receive a final check on instruments and radio television equipment. Here, technicians pour over the controllable bomb, testing all the mechanical controls. The control ship, in this instance a B-23, is sending out a series of radio signals to enable the technicians to observe the reactions of the small plane's controls. The three axis gyro stabilizers, which aid in controlling the bomb, are checked and set. The television camera and equipment are given final adjustments, and the controllable bomb is ready for the test. During these tests, you will hear the actual radio signals which controlled the bomb, and the two-way conversation which took place at that time. The engine is started. The engine is started. The torpedo is ready to The tone you are now hearing is the radio tone modulation signal being sent from the B-23 control ship to increase the throttle on the controllable bomb and bring the engine up to flying speed. The launching car races up the track at 102 miles per hour. And the bug makes a perfect takeoff. Beep. 
On this flight, the follow-up ratios on the spoilers and the rudder have been reduced from previous flights. The GM controllable bomb is controlled in flight by spoilers instead of ailerons. It is equipped with three gyroscopes, one directional and two roll gyros to aid in balancing the tiny craft. All three are in operation now. In level flight, such as you see here, the controllable bomb's average airspeed is 150 miles per hour. At full throttle, approximately 180 miles per hour. As the bomb flies along here, the control ship follows a few miles behind and off to one side. In the co-pilot's seat of the control ship sits the man who guides this flying bomb by means of varying radio tones transmitted between the ships. Directly in front of him is a television screen which gives an exact picture of the bomb's flight as seen by the television camera mounted beneath the controllable bomb. This enables him to fly the bug as though he were actually in it. Notice the strong vibrations of the radio antennas on the bug now. A short time later, the bomb crashed. DT-1 Glide Torpedo. This standard torpedo with an airframe attached uses the preset control method. It was designed for use against harbor shipping without the necessity of the carrier planes entering the range of protecting anti-aircraft guns. A paravane hanging under the airframe strikes the water and detonates an airframe release mechanism just prior to the torpedo entering the water. This projectile was used with much success against enemy shipping in the Pacific during July of 1945. This GB-1 glide bomb and its twin, the GB-2, use 1,000 and 2,000 pound general purpose bombs. Controls on both are preset. With no remote or homing control after release, the bomb is limited in accuracy. It was developed for use against large targets that were well protected by flak. A further development was the GB-8, basically the same as former GB bombs, but using radio-controlled equipment installed in the tail. To facilitate visual control, flares are installed in the tail section. These flares can be seen for 12 miles in daylight. The bombardier following the smoke or light trail can change the azimuth of shortwave control from the carrier plane. Good visibility is necessary between the bomb release and target. The GB-4, also a radio controlled glide bomb, is mounted on an airframe especially designed by the Air Materiel Command. This missile is guided to the target by television equipment attached to the bottom of the bomb. Clear weather between the carrier plane and the target is necessary, for the objective is held in constant view on the television screen. When released, the bomb attains the speed of approximately 280 miles per hour. The pursuit for pinpoint accuracy is well on its way with this GB-4. Though limited by haze and overcast, it is an excellent missile against difficult targets, such as bridges, dams, tunnels, and ships, for these objects are clearly discernible on a television screen. The GB-4 tests have shown fair success. Further developments on this model have produced the GB-15, which is expected to prove even more accurate. The GB-6, built to react almost like a homing pigeon, homes heat energy radiating from a target. The Hofner heat-seeking unit is attached to the nose of a standard general-purpose bomb. It is useful against blast furnaces, steel mills, and power plants. It may also be used against naval targets when within a two and one half mile range. 
The GB7 is the forerunner of experiments for perfect accuracy in all types of weather. It is a radar seeker. Similar to other GB bombs in basic features, it has a radio homing device attached to the nose. The VB series are the free-falling counterpart of the glide bomb. This Azon or VB-1 is a thousand pound standard general purpose bomb utilizing a radio control unit and the tail assembly. The bomb is controllable in azimuth only with range calculated prior to dropping. Several planes can operate in the same area at the same time by using different channels for control purposes. The Azon was used with successful results in the Mediterranean, Europe, and CBI theaters. Guided by flares installed in the tail section, it is particularly adaptable to long, narrow targets. Pinpoint accuracy was obtained in clear weather. The Razon, a further development of the Azon, is controllable in both range and azimuth. These bomb drops show its amazing accuracy. In comparison with the non-controllable free-falling bomb, the Razon is pinpointed on the target. Against a naval target, the effect would be conclusive. The free-falling heat seeker is designated the VB-6. There are no known countermeasures. The Air Force is now experimenting on possible methods of deviating the bomb from its course by raising and lowering the heat radiation surrounding a target. This British tall boy with a circular wing placed at the center of gravity is designated the VB-13 or Tarzan. The German V-1 flying bomb weighs three tons at takeoff, including a full tank of fuel, and delivers 1,870 pounds of explosive, slightly less than one-third the total weight. The overall length is 25 feet, four inches, with a wingspan of 16 feet. Construction is similar to a miniature aircraft. It is a mid-wing monoplane with a single fin and rudder. Before launching, the compass and rudder are set for direction. These American experiments show the three methods of launching the V-1 from ground sight. Rocket power is the first. Once launched, it is controlled by an automatic pilot monitored by the magnetic compass housed in the nose. There is no evidence to indicate that the jet-propelled flying bomb could be guided to the target by radio.
The abusive project found a use for obsolete aircraft. They were turned into the world's largest buzz bomb. There is no record of this project ever being operational, but a detachment of men known as the Weary Willie Project were working on a guided aircraft program during January 1945 at the European Theater. Based on work originated in 1938, these obsolete aircraft have been modified for use as guided missiles, usable against either area or pinpoint targets. When loaded, they carry 18,500 pounds of explosives and can be preset for or remotely controlled to a target. This missile can be classified as a super suicide attack plane without the expenditure of personnel. Guided by the control plane to within 10 miles of the proposed target, the remotely controlled missile is good for pinpoint accuracy. A test back in October of 1943 showed a miss of only 30 feet on a target 30 feet square, and accuracy is deadlier now. The Type A3 waterborne missile is capable of 42 miles an hour when carrying an 8,000 pound explosive load. It has a range of 250 miles at full speed. The speed, fast or slow, the turn right or left, and the ignition are all remotely controlled. This missile had been turned over to the Special Projects Office of the Office of Strategic Services for use in May 1944. The dream of 1919, now in actuality, is our lesson for today. The dream of today is the fact of tomorrow, with the secrets of radio, radar, and television open and the speed of 4,000 miles per hour considered old stuff, it is no longer possible for skeptics to ridicule basically sound theories, like, for example, the future possibility of supersonic speeds up to 16,000 miles per hour. Fantastic and advanced as these missiles may seem to come. The Air Forces already consider them obsolete. Now with atomic power and actuality, the question is, what is in the future? Research of today is our look into the future.